Howdy. Welcome to another week of Canon Calls. This week, I called an old professor of mine, Dr. Andy Nacelli, to chat about biblical theology and a few books of his that are coming out next year. If you listen to the episode and the topic of biblical theology interests you, I wanted to point your attention to our theology tab at canonpress.com that you can find in the show notes. Um, There you can find plenty of interesting topics, such as a critique of youth ministry, a biblical theology of culture, several commentaries, and even a few surveys that ought to supplement your everyday Bible reading. So without further ado, meet Dr. Andy Nacelli. Hey, this is Andy. Professor Nacelli. Hey, Jake. How are you, sir? I am well. You? I've missed the brevity. Um, <laughs> I've missed the brevity. Uh, I'm great. Thank you so much for doing this. Are you a full-time student, work part-time for Canon Press? or something? I So I was, and then I graduated. So I'm now full-time. So okay, so you stayed in Idaho, and you worked for Canon Press full-time? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. Yes, sir. So what I wanted to do is I was thinking uh, I loved your class on biblical theology. Um, So I reached out to my biblical theology professor, and I found out that you just finished a book. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about the book? Yeah, it's called 40 Questions on Biblical Theology. It's a 40 question series that Kriegel Press publishes. And this is a book that it's like a it's a basic overview that I I co-authored with two friends, Jason DeRoshi, who teaches Old Testament, and Oren Martin, who teaches systematic theology. I teach systematic theology and New Testament, so we all have different uh, expertises to bring into the the project. So each of us drafted about a third of the book, and then we gave feedback to the other other guys. Fantastic. And you said it's 40 questions. What was the rest of it? 40 questions about biblical theology. Okay. So, you know, it, it has like part one is defining biblical theology. So a bunch of questions about what is it? How do you do it? And part two compares different approaches to it. So there are different theological systems that do it a little differently and evangelicals practice it in different ways. And then uh, part three, it illustrates it by tracing themes. And then it ends, I think, by uh, just uh, illustrating it uh, with the use of earlier scripture and later scripture, the use of the old and the new. Oh, no, there's a part five. It's uh, applying it. How How does it work in the church and the home and such. There you go. So when you say biblical theology, how is that distinct from maybe uh, other forms of theology? Yeah. So there are basically five theological disciplines and biblical theology is one of those disciplines. So if I, you mind if I just take a second and just briefly show how. Please. Yeah. So when you're thinking about it's what theological method is basically, how do you, how do you, theology? How, do you, how does it all fit together? And to do that, you have to ask, well, what are the components involved and how do they fit together? How do they, how do they interrelate? And it starts with, well, I can't say it starts with because you're using all five of them when you do any one of them. But if I'll just say, if you could <laughs> simplistically map it out, it starts with exegesis, which is interpreting a text by analyzing what the author intended to communicate. So our text is the Bible. And unlike other text. This one is authored by God and humans. So it, it, it means that when you're looking at a text, sometimes the human author may write things and he doesn't fully understand all the implications of. And God, who is also the author, could be intending things that are consistent with what the human author intends. Uh, so basically, uh, God can intend more but never less than what the human author intends. Now, that's important for when you go back and read Old Testament passages in light of the whole. So exegesis is, is, is uh, the first of the five, and then biblical theology is the second. I'll define that at the end. And then uh, the third component is historical theology, which is you know, you're surveying and evaluating how significant exegetes and theologians have understood the Bible and theology, you know, uh, stalwarts like Augustine and Calvin and Luther. And then systematic theology is a, is a fourth. Uh, that basically answers the question, what does the whole Bible say about and then you fill in the blank. So it's it's systematically, it's comprehensively trying to show how the whole Bible does not contradict itself. It all fits together. How? And and then finally, it's practical theology. That's applying the text to yourself, the church, the world. How should we live in light of, of what's there? Now, biblical theology, um, I'll go back to, to that one. That 
that studies how the whole Bible progresses over time, because God didn't d- deliver it all in one, one time historically, it came over time. How does the whole Bible progress and integrate and climax in Jesus? So biblical theology, uh, when you do it, you're, you're making organic uh, salvation historical, uh, that is, connections about uh, how God has saved people throughout history, salvation historical connections with the whole Bible on its own terms, and especially regarding how the Old and New Testaments relate, how they integrate and climax in Christ. So it's it's basically, you're focusing on the turning points in the Bible storyline, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, or consummation. And then, uh, you're, so yeah, Old Testament theology, New Testament theology, those are subsets of whole Bible biblical theology. So the my basic case that I, I make when I teach this, uh, I, as you know, when we had this class together, is that we must read the whole Bible right now, including the Old Testament, with Christian eyes. And so many people think that the pristine way to interpret the Old Testament is to read a passage like you were, you know, Joe Jew existing at that moment in time. It didn't have any further revelation after that. Like that interpretation is the most uh, pure. And I'd say, no, 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 no. That, that's, that's a good starting point. But we've got the full revelation now, and we need to read the whole Bible in light of that. I remember when I had your class, you talked about this um, in terms of reading even just like modern day literature. So I think you used Harry Potter as I an did. example. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> sure. So uh, sometimes this is controversial when I use Harry Potter as an example because some <laughs> some, some good Christians, uh, uh, their consciences uh, do not allow them to enjoy those stories. So um, just giving a nod to those, to those folks right. and hoping I don't uh, offend them. Uh, I, I love Harry Potter. I think the books are brilliant. And uh, here's the illustration. So it's, it's a seven book fantasy literature series if you haven't read it. And the first time uh, my wife and I read through these books, um, we basically we, we listened to it. Uh, Jim Dale is a brilliant uh, uh, audio narrator, and we're listening to the stories, and we're basically just asking questions like, you know, what's going to happen next? What just happened? Who said what? It's just a very basic follow the storyline, and it's it's just a, such a, a f- enjoyable, thrilling story. We really really loved it together. So we finished it, and then I think maybe three weeks, three. Or, Two three years later, we said, "Hey, let's 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 read those books again." And this is this is what's so interesting. So I should have seen this coming, but uh, since I teach biblical theology, uh, we start book one, and we keep pausing it and saying things like, "Did you did you hear that?" Uh, J.K. Rowling, the author, picks up on that theme in book three and five and seven. I, we totally missed that the first time. We do that over and over and over because these aren't the, the kind of literature that uh, that you know some author just kind of slapped out book by book, you know, kind of making stuff as she went along. She mapped out the whole storyline intricately before she wrote book one. And you can tell it all fits together so neatly. Uh, now, that's just a taste uh, of, of, uh, of how it works in the Bible. The Bible is, off, is obviously a very different kind of book. Uh, but it just shows that once you've read through the Bible once and you've got the, the storyline in mind, you, you know who the characters are, you know what happens. As you read and reread and reread and reread, you make connections that are richer and deeper than you could have made before because of your familiarity with the storyline. And you start to see things the author intended that you couldn't have seen the first time you read through or even the second or third. So biblical theology is all about making those author-intended connections throughout the Bible. Uh, Harry Potter is not the only example. You could use examples of movies like uh, a mystery movie. Or like a, a movie like Interstellar, or, or something like that, uh, or just epic, epic stories. It's like that with any kind of big story. That's good. I uh, I was surprised. I remember when taking your class, the the final grade, the final assignment was that everybody wrote a biblical theology paper and then had to present it, and the the breadth of topics covered, um, really, I think would have surprised me day one had you told me that. Um, mm-hmm. The this amount, so we had like things like food or yeah. biblical theology of all kinds of things. Um, is there any in particular, any topic in particular that just that really uh shifted the way you thought or where you know how you viewed the scriptures as a whole? Um, what's been like maybe the biggest cash out that sound that sounds utilitarian, but what's been <laughs> the most spiritually you know enriching topic oh. of biblical theology? There, there's so many. Uh, I, I guess what's on my front burner right now is snakes and dragons because I just oh, yeah. wrote a book on that. I told, I think I told you several years ago. You I did a book on that. I just finished it. Yeah. Wow. So okay. it's going to come out next year, 2020, with Crossway. Uh, tentative title, 
is is not kill the dragon, get the girl. They didn't like that title. They okay. went with um, the serpent and the serpent slayer. I think that's a title. That's so fun. We are coming out with a book, Dragon Dragons and Dragon Slayers, from no uh, way. Tim Chester in December. Oh, he's gonna beat me. Okay, what's yours? Yes, tell me about. T- do you want to talk about it? Sure, sure. So my my basic take is, well, you're gonna tell Tim. No, I guess he's already done. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's finished. Yeah, it's been done. Okay, I'm teasing. My basic take is that uh, you got the big category serpent, and then there are two types of serpents in scripture snake and dragon so a snake is a type of a serpent a dragon is a type of a serpent and uh, satan the ultimate serpent can take the form of a snake or a dragon depending on what he's trying to do so there are different strategies of uh, that he has to to hurt god's people and when he wants to deceive he takes a strategy of a snake and when he wants to devour he takes a strategy of a dragon and he he alternates throughout scripture uh, whether directly or indirectly through his children, his seed, uh, you know, like dragons, like like little dragons, like like Pharaoh, king of Egypt, yeah, or or uh, Goliath, or or the Pharisees. Goliath's uh, who, a really cool one. Can you talk about that real quick? Uh, sure. Uh, so he's got armor that has scales. That uh, it's the same word everywhere else. This Hebrew word occurs refers to fish scales, and in the passage in Ezekiel, it lines up with. With uh, 1 Samuel 17, uh, showing that uh, this is dragon scales. That the, the author is is intentionally portraying Goliath as a dragon figure. Yeah, awesome. it's yeah, it's beautiful. Great. Anyway, so the, the basic take is in, in the book argument is that uh, Satan is the serpent who takes the form of a snake or a dragon. Jesus is the ultimate serpent slayer, and we participate in serpent slaying but ultimately we rest in him as our serpent slayer and the the climax is in revelation 12 and 20 and then just asking you so so how do we live in light of that story uh, is how i end so that's, uh, that's really yeah. awesome that's really awesome chester's is is a uh, is a uh, you guys will not collide at all it, it's uh is, is uh, basically myths all around the world about oh, the okay. topic so itself. I, so you have a BT. I, his, his, his was not a biblical theology. My first chapter talks about, I, I think I survey a uh, half dozen uh, stories like that. So, you know, That's awesome. The, the classic so that will, St. That George and the Dragon, yep. um, Beowulf, uh, to those, those stories. And then I even survey Harry Potter for a bit, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, Lord of the Rings, Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, so many classic stories uh, have a serpent theme throughout them. And that kill the dragon, get the girl motif is beautiful throughout. Yeah. Love That's it. awesome. That's awesome. But I do, it, I, I just now remembered, I mean, when you mentioned it, that, that okay. you, you were, you were starting it. So that's awesome to see it come out. Is that, will that be in that series? Um, yeah, it's like, I think it's called short studies in biblical theology. It, they're uh, Dan always Orland, like great books. Pelt. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome series. Yeah. So basically you, you were asking me about themes yeah. And I just would want to back up and say there, there are different ways that you can do biblical theology. One of them is to analyze or, or trace a theme, where you, you trace a theme through the whole Bible, like I was just talking about with snakes and dragons, yep. or you can trace it through part of the Bible. And and my assignment for my, my biblical theology classes is often write a research paper that does that. And and you can do it for themes like atonement or circumcision or ethnicity or city of God, covenants, idolatry, image of God, uh, incarnation, kingdom, land, law, marriage, mystery, possessions, prayer, repentance, resurrection, temple, shepherd, temple, temple was a big temple's one. a big one. Yep, oh, work. So th- those are ways you can trace a theme through the Bible. And, and that's great. And I love that. But there are a couple other ways you can do it. Uh, another way to do biblical theology is to analyze the message either of the whole Bible or of, of books or sections of the Bible. So when you go uh, book by book, you could say, what's the, 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 the burden, the overall message of this book and of, of this author and of this section of the Bible and of this Testament and then of the whole Bible. And, and you try to make a, a case for what you think the theology, the driving message of the Bible is. Uh, and then, and so that's another way. And then the, the third way, so that's uh, what I've given you, analyze the message, trace yeah. themes. And then a, a third way, is to just tell the story. So you just tell the Bible's grand unfolding story, and you can do this with uh, certain themes more prominent than others. So there's a there's a book that just came out, one of the nine March books, and they do this with the theme of kingdom, and it's 
beautiful. They they summarize the Bible storyline in light of God's kingdom as the unifying theme. So they have, I think, uh, 15 headings. The king creates in covenants, the king curses, the king judges, the king blesses, the king rescues, the king commands, the king leads, rules, casts out, promises, arrives, suffers and saves, sends, reigns, returns. And, and you can just see how you could so easily write a children's book based off of those headings. Sure. Uh, and adults love a good story too. And, and some really good books present biblical theology by just telling the overall story in a, a theologically informed way. I remember too, what was the YouTube channel that we would, we would check in on sometimes? The Bible Project. So that's yes. a, I still watch their videos. I don't agree with all of them in every way, of course, but they're in the main, they're really, really edifying. Yeah. So they've got videos that overview the message of each book of the Bible. And then they have uh, videos that uh, do biblical theological themes that they trace through. Very, very interesting. I've watched them all with my kids. We love them. Awesome. Awesome. Now, we jumped right in. Um, you have several books yourself on top of the ones coming out. Do you mind just telling us who you are? <laughs> okay. And I would love to uh, supply any any anecdotes that I can along the way. Uh, probably not true. I wouldn't trust you about anecdotes. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> So basically, uh, I'm uh, Andy Nacelli. My wife, Jenny, and I have four daughters. Uh, oldest is 11, youngest is two. We live in Minneapolis where I teach systematic theology and New Testament and ethics at Bethlehem College and Seminary, where Jake, you graduated with yes, an undergrad. Sir. And then I'm one of the pastors of Bethlehem Baptist Church. Um, my focus at the North Campus. I just love serving God in a, in a, a, a church and a school that exists to, and this is our mission statement, we would exist to spread a passion for the supremacy of God in all things, for the joy of all peoples through Jesus Christ. And my particular role in that mission is four activities, and that's research, write, teach, and shepherd. And I love doing all four, and, and doing any one of those helps the other three. Uh, I, I love what God's called me to do. Now, is the, the preaching is new to me, correct? Or the pastoral role in particular? Uh, my first couple of years here, I was not a pastor, uh, but I don't remember when that happened, but it may have been after you left. El I, know, I think you, I remember you being an elder and maybe, okay. uh, but I don't know. Oh, that elder the, and pastor the, is the same thing. Cor so cor we have paid. Yeah. Sorry. In our, in our polity, an elder is a pastor, is a bishop. It's, it's, but we have paid pastors and volunteer pastors. So I'm a volunteer pastor. Uh, we have, uh, pastors who that's their, their paid vocation. My paid vocation is, is being a that's professor. Fine. Okay. Maybe it's the North focus that threw me through a loop. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. And then I took you, so is ethics, is ethics a new thing that you're teaching? Um, I don't remember when I started that. I've been doing it for, I think five years. Okay. I love it. So it's, 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 it, you know, I've, I've taken that on and really given a lot of time to it. I, uh, when, when I think you came my sophomore year, we, uh, all I heard was that, uh, this guy who came out of, uh, uh, oh, forgive me. Where was DA Carson at? Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Yes. And I had just taken my first year of Greek and, you know, really um, dragged my body across the finish line. <laughs> and uh, we were still in the, we were in the dark about who was going to teach second year. And, um, you know, it's, it's just assumed that when you move into your second year that you have a, uh, a real grasp of first year, which alarmed me. <laughs> and uh, then we heard that we had we had the new guy, Dr. Andy Nacelli, who uh, knows a thing or two about Greek. And so I was n very nervous going into first day. And then uh, it all worked out in the end. I, I, I ended up making an A. I did great. I loved your class. I think we had what fun. Was it in on? Your, we had fun in your class? class. What was the topic of the class? Like, what, was it a... We did uh, Mounts's... Um, we basically just... Uh, you know, the 37 uses of the genitive oh, all, all the okay. way through the different parts of speech. So, okay, great. Um, I think we had fun. Good. Okay, good. good. Um, <laughs> so in particular, would you say you have a, uh, the, one of the books that I have of yours that's on my shelf that I really enjoyed was, um, I think it actually was a dissertation topic, if I'm wrong, on Romans 11. Yeah. So I wrote one on Ro the very end of Romans 11. It's verses 34 and 35. So in, in terms of uh, biblical theology, do you, can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So uh, basically the, the genesis of that is I took a, a, a doctoral seminar with Don Carson on the use of the old and the new. 
And we had to write a couple of research papers on particular passages where the New Testament uses the old. And I decided to choose Romans 11, 34 and 35, because that's my favorite portion of scripture. So, you know, that portion, it's, uh, oh, the depths of the riches, the wisdom and knowledge of God, how in search bars, judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. And, and then he quotes uh, Isaiah 40, and then he quotes Job 41. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? That's quoting Isaiah. And then quotes Job, who has ever given to God that God should repay them? And then uh, Paul concludes, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And I was just curious, you know, what's going on there? Um, What did Paul intend by using the Old Testament the way he did? So I just looked at Romans 11 in context, Isaiah 40 in context, Job 41 in context, looked at textual critical issues. And then thought through, you know, how, how, how does Jewish literature use Isaiah 40 and Job 41? Um, and then this nail uh, kind, of, kind of honed in on what is Paul's hermeneutical warrant for using Isaiah 40 and Job 41 the way he does? And then how does he theologically use those passages? So that's probably more than you wanted to know. No, that's there perfect. <laughs> so when I went into Bethlehem College, I was not someone who was inclined to studies, I guess. As I sat through classes and as I uh, had my professors walk with me through those kind of things, I fell in love with it. And so um, I try my best to, to keep a side pile of books to go through um, biblical theology uh, texts. And so as I thought, you know, who could I have on that could really unpack those? And you've done it several times. So with, uh, with whether it's that book, your Serpent book, which I'm excited about, what other books would you recommend for um, maybe somebody who's just a, a, a lay churchgoer who's interested in kind of prodding around. Um, if before they get to your book in a year, what would you recommend? So books on biblical theology. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I'll mention several. Uh, the, the one book I use as a required textbook, I think I would have for you as well. It's called The New Dictionary of Biblical Theology. It's, it's uh, the IVP 2000. So the, the editors are uh, Desi Alexander and Brian Rosner. It's the all-around best book on yes. biblical theology. Okay. So it's, it starts off with 12 essays, including a really good one by Don Carson called Systematic Theology and Biblical Theology. And then part two uh, just goes over the, the biblical sections and then uh, essay on each book of the Bible. And then the very last section has over 140 articles on different themes. So it's excellent. So that's a good starting point. There's a, uh, a handbook by Greg Beal called Handbook on the New Testament, Use of the Old. Uh, it's really good. I think it's 2012. Um, there's a commentary that Beale and Carson edited called Commentary on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament, 2007. Right. Fantastic resource. Oh, you there's had, a series. Go you, ahead. You had us uh, do, I think it was you that had us, uh, we did Hamilton's little book. Yeah. What is Biblical Theology? Okay. Yeah. Going. There's a series that Carson edits called New Studies in Biblical Theology. Uh, he's been editing that since 1995. It's still going. And it, that does biblical theology in all kinds of ways. So good. Awesome. Um, if you've got kids, you could start off young. Oh yeah, with, great question. Uh, yeah, great. like the biggest story: how the snake crusher brings us back to the garden. That's Kevin DeYoung. Okay, uh, that's a that's a, a very short one. You can read it in a half hour. He's coming out with a big one that's, uh, from Crossway soon. Uh, there's a still for kids. I remember? Uh, yeah, that's okay. for kids. I'm thinking of another one for kids. Uh, David Helm, I think it is. David Helm has one um, called I forget. I've read to my kids so many times. There's another one by, by Sally Lloyd Jones called the Jesus Storybook Bible. Okay. Also very good. Oh, David Helms is called the Big Picture Story Bible, uh, Crossway 2004, uh, for really young children. That might be the best one to start with for really young children. So that's, that's Biblical Theology for Kids, uh, Back to Adults. Um, there's a book called Five Views on Law and Gospel, and that's that's connected to biblical theological issues. Uh, I really like Doug Moo's uh, view in there. Um, there's a book called 40 Questions About Christians' Biblical Law. That's another thing on that. That's uh, Tom Schreiner. Is that Kriegel, um, is that Kriegel too? Yep, same okay. series as my snake book. Okay. No, no, same same question, same series as my the 40, 40 Questions of Biblical Theology book, yeah. Um, Oswald Schreiner's got a, a big one called The King and His Beauty, A Biblical Theology of the Old New Testaments. Oh, yes. So yep. there are a few. That one I yeah. read. Um, okay. Did, did Sam Sorms do a book in that 40, 40 Questions series? Not that I'm aware of. He's written a lot of books, so yeah. Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, perfect. Well, Andy, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on, man. Um, your book on serpents comes out 
next year also? Sorry, give me a probably, date on that. Probably fall 2020, around there somewhere. Okay, so you've got, you've got a busy 2020. We'll see. Thank you so much, Professor. Pleasure.